Hello everyone, and thank you for joining this session where uh, we discussed about how we can leverage the TP data flow to implement a robust and high performing code in a logical way. I'm very excited to uh, present this session. Um, I, my experience, I become familiar with this tool because the TP data flow at that time was the answer, the right tool when I had to design high performance in parallel system without compromising uh, the high performance uh, code ability and the robustness of the program. But even better, I was pleased to find out that the TPL of the flow uh, promotes uh, uh, the pipeline programming model, which uh, it can be used to solve a complex problem uh, in a seamless and logical way. In a modern application, uh, there are many scenarios where the data flow processing is used, such as you know large volume data streaming, uh, image or video processing conversion, uh, data migration, and, and so on. And the TP data flow can be leveraged uh, in all those scenarios. How can we use the TP data flow to solve complicated problems in a logical way? Well, uh, all that you have to do is to break apart a big problem into a small problem. So you have a complex, a complex problem you want to solve. And imagine you want to solve the problem in a top-down way. So you start with a big problem, and then you decompose it into smaller problems until eventually are small enough that you can just directly solve the problem. And then, uh, as a result, you have a set of small solutions, which then you can be uh, glued back together to solve the original large problem. And this all leveraging the compositionality uh, aspect of the TPI flow that, uh, uh, that it offers. And the data flow composition is really the glue to put together our big solution. Um, in your world is composed of many autonomous things. And uh, in my opinion, really the TP data flow structure the code closer to those real uh, problem domain. So it becomes easy to reason about your problem. And uh, it provides the tools to build and find tool system capable also to process a huge data set and do it efficiently. So you get the best of both worlds. So the main takeaway on this session are that the TP data flow uh, provide a foundation for a message passing programming model uh, that is to um, uh, parallelize uh, the, the parallelization for both CPU intense and IO intense application that have a high throughput and low latency. And then uh, the TP data flow gives you explicit control over how data is buffered and moves around to the system, improving responsiveness and throughput uh, by managing the, the efficiently the underlying threads, which um, allow easily to create a mesh operation that they work together in coordination. And ultimately, the TP data flow is a tool to use when uh, performance critical, when uh, um, is performance a critical component in your application. So first of all, what is a data flow? Right? It's, a, it's a programming uh, paradigm that model a set operation as a graph, where um, the data flow between uh, those operations, those steps. Uh, most applications are defined as a series of functions uh, that operate on common data, on common state. And uh, so the data flow uh, emphasize the movement of those data and define the inputs and the outputs of those connected operations uh, that uh, really look like and behave like a pipeline. And its core, the uh, TPL data flow is a set of constructs built on top of uh, the uh, Microsoft uh, Task Parallel Library, which uh, it can help you uh, to create a robust uh, declarative concurrent program reducing a lot of the complexity that can be introduced in a multi-trading uh, uh, environment. Um, in general, the TP data flow consists of one or more blocks, and each block can be connected to another block to shape a pipeline, uh, where um, 
the data, our data move from one block to another block. And these blocks are responsible to apply some behavior that you inject uh, on a data that could then be you know, uh, generated and transformed during the, during the pipeline. And uh, the TPL flow reduce the complexity when implementing CURE program because it allows us to control the shared state and make it very difficult to change the state and, and uh, um, between threads. So the data flow programming model is uh, um, related to the concept of message passing where um, independent um, component, uh, independent unit of a program communicate with one another by sending messages that are passed um, as the input value to, 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 to the blocks. So the, this programming model is also known as the share nothing because the blocks uh, communicate uh, using messages rather than share of state, which take back you know, the, 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 the comment about they make it very difficult to share the state among thread and so reduce the complexity in a multi-thread environment. Um, and when we share this thread uh, in a multi-thread program, traditionally, we must use locks to synchronize the access of the share of resources. But lock-based um, programs do not compose. We cannot take two atomic operations and create one more atomic operation after them, right? So the foundation of uh, the TP data flow is um, using building block. And we will see shortly how those block look and work. And these components are useful when we want uh, a multiple operation that must communicate with uh, one another, uh, both asynchronously and asynchronously, uh, when you want to process data as soon as it becomes available. In fact, uh, one very important concept around the TP data flow is that is a push model rather than pulling model which also emphasize the reactive aspect of this uh, tool, this programming model. So there are about uh, 14 different building blocks to implement any sort of complex scenario. And um, in advanced cases, you can even implement your own. Um, for um, coming demo, we'll use just a couple, but I really hope um, that uh, by the end of this session, I'll give you the wonder uh, to check all the powerful uh, TPL blocks you could use to, to implement um, um, and solve your problems. So the first block is the buffer block, um, is the most uh, fundamental block and represent um, a general purpose uh, asynchronous message structure that uh, it provides you know, either um, bounded and unbounded buffer uh, for storing messages. And, um, in general, it's good practice to have buffer blocks at the start and the end of each sub workflow. Uh, some block also have a built-in already the buffer block, either you have to add, add yourself, depending on uh, what you try to achieve. Uh, but uh, when the target block receives a message from a buffer block, the message then is moved from the uh, queue of the buffer block. And uh, in the buffer block is a, uh, is useful when you want to pass uh, multiple messages to another component and that component must receive each message in, a, in a keeping the order of the original order. And of course, this component, this block, like all the other block, uh, intrinsically already support both synchronous and asynchronous operation without you know, any, uh, any, any changes. But the important part of the buffer block is that uh, is store the messages in a queue, um, um, in a queue in a first in first out manner um, fashion that can be uh, written by multiple sources and read also by multiple targets at the same time. And this behavior makes this block a great tool to implement easily uh, um, sophisticated and high performance producer consumer pattern. Um, as you know, the producer consumer pattern really is one of the most popular and fundamental pattern uh, employed in many uh, parallel applications with the producer consumer, um, where one or more producer threads um, generate data that is consumed by one or more uh, consumer in a different thread. 
and these consumer then, um, then can themselves also produce or manipulate and generate further data, which is then consumed again by other consumer and so forth. Um, and this only forms like a, a pipeline where each level of um, consumer represents another stage in a pipeline. So another uh, building block is the action block on the TP data flow, and it's used to execute uh, a given uh, callback, like for um, any message, any item sent into it. And you can think this block logically as a, as a buffer for data um, that combine um, with a task for processing the input values. So in other words, uh, the action block is a target block, so you can send messages and then when you receive a message, react and call an internal delegate that you inject when you receive the data. And uh, similar like a for each loop, when the execution of the dele delegate is done asynchronously, and it will be uh, the default process um, for um, all of the element that uh, uh, you pass into it. Then we have the uh, transform, uh, transform block, uh, which act like a mapping function, uh, which applies a projection function to um, <clears throat> an input value and provide a correlated transform output. So the transformation function um, is passing an argon type of T and, um, and it produces an output type of R, right? And the default behavior is to process one message at a time, maintaining the strict, you know, first in, first out of ordering as the other blocks. So you can see we have different kind of input here, they transform them to a different output. In the slide, you can see the code, how these blocks also look. And when you send a message post, you send a message. Uh, in this case, uh, on the slide, we post a message, which is a blocking operation. But to increase throughput, there is another API that is called uh, send async, where you send a message in a file forget fashion, uh, asynchronously no blocking, uh, which increases also the throughput of your application. Um, a transform block is generally um, used in combination with um, other block, where it passes the output of the projection as input to the next block. In this case, uh, we are linking um, the transform block to another action block to generate the operation as a side effect. So in general, the action block uh, produce, um, doesn't produce an output, it just create uh, the, the, the final operation. So in this case, we can, for example, use the action block to, uh, so we can use the transform block to transform the data and ultimately the action block to provide side effects such as maybe persist the file system, um, call or persist database and so forth. And uh, the, the, also we can link a block to other block at the same time. So we can send a message to different block as a, um, we compose uh, our mesh of, of different kind of building block for uh, implementing our solution. Uh, this is our look and the link uh, function here is actually a, um, an extension method um, that uh, link a source block to a target block, really connected to block. It also provides also some uh, other uh, insensibilities, such as um, you, can, you can ingest also a predicate or filter, which can filter only the messages that pass a sexually the predicate to inject. So you can just uh, send a message to a block, the link to, and send a message to the following block only if the messages, the output, satisfy the predicate. The broadcast block is useful when uh, you must pass a message to uh, other component uh, uh, at the same time. So uh, when you already broadcast um, the, the message to a uh, different component at the same time. And the a broadcast uh, take as argument uh, delegate, they go T to T. Uh, there is not only transformation in this block, but allow that to define and overwrite how we want to uh, clone the message, right? Because we want to pass a new uh, copy of the message uh, um, to the other um, component that we're broadcasting the, the, the message. And this is what the broadcast uh, uh, does, right? And really, its uniqueness is that 
is send a message to all the link consumer uh, with one post, one info, one send a message. Uh, next, um, one impress property is that by default, all the TPL data flow block process one message at a time, uh, queuing all the messages uh, and process it you know, uh, one at a time. However, there are cases when we want to process messages as fast as possible. And it's okay uh, to, um, that it is okay when multiple messages can be processed in parallel. And uh, for this, we can just set uh, the proprietary uh, max degree of parallelism, and uh, which also apply individually for each block. So each block can have its own uh, different kind of level of parallelism. In this case, so each block, we can send multiple messages at a time, and uh, that's going to be processed in, in, in concurrently on parallel uh, uh, for both either CPU or IO bound operation. So we can send, for example, we can send the, the max degree of parallelism of two, we can send two messages at a time, and uh, this is going to be processed in parallel. Um, as you can see, the code changes are minimal, and the, the DOP or the degree of parallelism mode is used to um, really increase the, the throttle, the throttling property for each block. All right, so, uh, but uh, enough talking, right, about a uh, high-level idea, but let's see how in action, how we can solve a problem. For this example, I thought to um, how we can implement a parallel web crawler. So the idea is that we know um, initially what kind of problem we want to solve, and then we're breaking apart a small solution, and then we glue them together. So for the uh, web crawler here, well, first of all, you know, we want to solve it in step and uh, try to create a smaller solution that we're going, um, we're going to glue them back together. In this case, we generate a downloader, which is possible to download uh, HTML content from our web page. Then we want to have two blocks, uh, one that link the, the images um, from the content of the web page, all the reference images, so we can download the images. And then we add another link uh, parser that link uh, that the parse and extract all the reference to other web pages from the uh, HTML content we just downloaded, which ultimately we can resend back to the original um, uh, block that load web page. So recursively and continually, we're going to crawl and crawl and crawl all the content of the web page. Of course, we have a broadcast in this case to split. So the same content web page is going to send to both the messages of the link parser link image. Then we have another block to persist the uh, images to the local file system. So we receive the image of the, the reference or the link of the image, download the image and persist to the local file system just for the purpose. It can be anything else, right? Really. And then ultimately, as I said, we can resend back all the uh, link to the other web pages to the original point where you can start to uh, download all the other pages. Um, and of course, we can imagine all these small steps as a TPL data flow, okay? So let's demo. And by the way, the source code is on this link on my GitHub. So you can download the code here. We're also going to be the slide uh, to check uh, the code. So I have um, the solution here. I have the data flow web crawler. So as I mentioned, we have different kind of block here. We have the start function that take a list of, of URL that we want to start to parse, a degree of parallelism, and a callback that is done when we download ultimately the, the, the format of the image. We set the degree of parallelism uh, with the value that we pass in the function. In this case, I think it's going to be set to two. We can be anything. So the first block, he download the image, uh, sorry, they load the web page and uh, as a uh, text as a content. Uh, then the downloader with the block transform block, take the function we just defined downloaded and uh, download the content. And then as the slide where the broadcast, they send the message, the content the clone to both the link parser, which you use internally, take the content of the web page, extract all the link of the other web pages in the page and form a collection that is going to be pushed to the original block. This is the output, which is the list of our uh, link other web pages. Same thing for the image parser. 
which take the link for all the images that are in the uh, web page content. We use the HTML document here uh, to uh, parse the content of the page. So then we're going to uh, build the block, the broadcast, the message, uh, the output to two block. Actually, here I have an action block that to do some logging. So we're going to see where we run the application. And then the other block is the action block where we download the, 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 the image here. And then with the byte array, we're going to call the callback. The callback is defined in the, what we call the function. We actually set the parallelism to four. This is the list of just for the purpose of the link to the web page we're going to use. And the callback is just going to write to the local file system the image that we downloaded. And that's going to be on the folder here, the presented. Uh, last thing here, the last step is pretty much link all the building block that we just defined um, to our solution. So now I'm going to run the application here. And you can see they're going to start to loop together all the crawling, all the web page. We have some login here. And you can see here all the images are downloaded in our own local file system. All right, any other login about the, the uh, page that we just downloaded and crawled. Well, that's it uh, for the, the session. I really hope you have a, um, you enjoyed. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me on my uh, Twitter or email. Thank you very much.